Joining us now are Gwen Keyes Fleming, former district attorney in DeKalb County, which is, of course, right next to Fulton County in Georgia, and Barbara McQuaid, former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan and now a professor at the University of Michigan Law School. It's great to see you both. Thank you for joining me. Uh, Gwen, let me start with you. Just in terms of, of the things that we learned today, setting the report itself aside and when that may or may not become public, um, the word dangerous, um, I, I, we got really stuck on that when we were discussing this as we came to air with the story. Why do you think the DA's office is characterizing a potential release of the report as dangerous? What, is that, what, is, what does that say to you? Well, I can only surmise that she has witnesses at this point that she's trying to protect, not just defendants whose rights she's also trying to protect, but she wants to ensure that as possible witnesses are named in the report, that they would be available and healthy for trial. Uh, and so that is is obviously any prosecutor's number one concern is ensuring uh, that the case can proceed with all of the relevant facts. And you need to have your appropriate witnesses to be able to do that. Um, Barb, when we talk about uh, the number of witnesses here, or the, sorry, the number of people that have testified, I'm not a legal expert, but 75 seemed like a lot. How did you read that when you heard that statistic? It does seem like a lot, but what I hear when I hear a number like that is that she has done a very thorough job. I think in a case like this with a lot of different tentacles, you know, there are different aspects of this case. There's the fake elector scheme. There is the uh, statements to the Georgia legislature. There is the harassment of poll workers. There's the tampering with voting machines. All of those different things have a lot of components to them. And so to do a thorough job, you need to talk to a lot of people. One of the things that's uh, challenging when you're conducting a grand jury investigation is you think you have just one more witness and you talk to that witness and they tell you about five more people you realize you need to talk to. And so, you know, the never ending layers, uh, skins of, a, of an onion. Uh, but 75 is certainly a, a big number. Um, and in a state uh, where, um, you know, the, the facts are, are relatively confined in contrast to the federal investigation, which involves a number of different states. 75 strikes me as um, a, a big number, a lot of hard work, but a thorough effort to find out what happened here. And of course, it's an ongoing investigation. Now, Gwen, I know you were part of a Brookings Institution uh, paper that basically looked at the Georgia investigation and concluded there were a number of different charges that could be brought here. Can you talk a little bit about how you're seeing this case and the outlines as we stand now? Again, it's, there's a lot TBD, but what, what do you think is most perilous potentially for former President Trump, for example? Well, and again, that report was based on what we knew in the public realm. So as you started, you indicated that it was very rare that we had this conversation on tape. And as a result of that conversation, as well as a lot of the evidence that came to light through good reporting, uh, my colleagues and I thought there was a substantial likelihood of charges both under the election code for things like conspiracy to commit election fraud, uh, violation of oath or conspiracy to violate an oath of office, as well as your more traditional criminal crimes in Title 16 of the Georgia Code, things like false statements or forgery in the case of the alleged fake electors. And then obviously we're still waiting to see whether Fani and her team will pursue a RICO indictment, which would allow her to encompass all of these crimes, or certainly the ones that relate to the predicate acts under the statute, the predicate crimes, foundational crimes under the statute, and see what type of case she can build from there. Can I just uh, follow on that? When you talk about RICO charges, that's something she's used before to prosecute a number of Atlanta area musicians, rappers, uh, it, which is its own sort of Georgia thing that has been, you know, litigated in the public court of public opinion. But that is something she is comfortable using, Gwen. Um, in terms of the the ease of bringing a charge like that at the state level. Is there a meaningful difference between, you know, pursuing charges at the federal level versus the state level in a more circumscribed case like this? Yes. Actually, the Georgia RICO statute is much more broad and more favorable to prosecutors, some would argue. Uh, so it allows her to tell the whole story. And you're right. Fani has her own personal experience trying RICO uh, from the time that she took over as the DA, but also in her prior career as an assistant DA. She also has others on her team, like John Floyd, who uh, really wrote the treatise on RICO in Georgia, as well as some other states. 
And so that is one of the big questions we're all waiting to see is how she's going to use these resources and experience in this particular matter. 